is my slides visible, sir? Yes. Okay. Okay. Screen is getting shared. Okay. Is it proper visible, right, sir? Yes. Full screen is coming. Okay, sir. Okay. Okay. So good evening, all. Thank you, Nagan, sir, and thank you, uh, Raghunath, sir. Thank you, Kaishu, sir. Uh, okay. So today I'm gonna talk uh, regarding velocity time interval. Uh, this is quite advanced uh, area uh, in emergency medicine and also in critical care. Okay, so I will be taking my uh, velocity time interval through all these main headings. Okay, so basically uh, I have a case scenario here. Okay, uh, this is a 65 year old uh, male patient, known case of uh, diabetes, hypertension, uh, ischemic heart disease, uh, Chronic kidney disease on a medical management presented to the ER with multiple episodes of loose stools. Okay, more than 10 episodes of loose stools. On examination, patient is conscious, but patient is tachypneic. Uh, heart rate is 110 per minute, beats per minute regular. Blood pressure is 80 millimeters of mercury. But on auscultation, we found that there is minimal basal grubs on the auscultation, minimal pedal edema, and other systemic examinations were normal for this patient. Okay, so when we get these kind of a patients in our ER, our main concern is this patient is having an history of uh, there is a volume loss history, plus there are other uh, problems with this uh, patient. Is the patient is already CKD patient is IHD patient is long-standing uh, diabetes, long-standing hypertension patient. Okay, so main concern is directly should we start inotropes or should we give fluids and see how the patient is responding or should we? Lord bolus fluid or should we give allocate fluid or not so this is our ma main uh area because these type these type of uh, cases we'll get frequently like multiple comorbidities came with uh, uh, volume loss but still the patient looks maybe to us initially volume overload but the patient may be in uh, volume low status okay so should we give fluids or not so i hope after this class uh, we'll be able to come to a conclusion by the using of vta should we give fluids or not so coming to my uh, area Introduction. As everybody knows that point of care ultrasound is a fundamental tool in the emergency department, especially in managing critically ill patients. So we know that uh, we look for IVC, we look for lung status, we look for fluid in the abdomen, we will look for even uh, any evidence of uh, DVT with ultrasound, so many. Even in case of head injury, critically head injury patients, we look for uh, uh, the, uh, the optic nerve sheet diameter. Okay? And coming to uh, the hemodynamic, in, when a patient, you are considering a hemodynamically instability patient, a patient is who, who is hemodynamically instable, okay? The stroke volume and cardiac output are the very two keys for targeting organ perfusion and oxygen delivery. So coming to the uh, stroke volume and cardiac output, as everybody knows that pulmonary artery catheterization still is the, still, it's the gold standard, but it has its own limitations in the ICU settings and its and its complications, the time consuming step. So how we will calculate stroke volume and cardiac output to assess is this patient require fluid or is the patient is low stroke volume or is the patient is high cardiac, uh, is patient is cardiac output is not adequate. So for that, we are going to use this left ventricular velocity time interval. Here, I am going to talk more regarding and how to calculate all more in with left ventricular outflow tract, okay? There are other techniques even you can calculate mitral valve, also you can calculate right ventricular outflow tract. But here, mostly I'm gonna talk about left ventricular outflow tract velocity. So it's a validated, non-invasive, rapidly accurate echocardiographic measurement that is analogous to stroke volume. So once you get your left ventricular outflow tract BTA, it almost approximates, gives you a stroke volume. With that stroke volume, you can find out the cardiac output. So with the transverse echocardiography, the stroke volume is usually obtained as the product of left ventricular outflow tract cross-sectional area by the left ventricular velocity time interval. Basically, you multiply the cross-sectional layer of the left ventricle in the velocity time interval, you will get a stroke volume. With multiply into heart rate, you will get a cardiac output. So again, the main important question in when we get a patient's is this patient needs fluids? Is this patient is able to tolerate the fluid what we are going to give to the patient? Okay. Coming to the pulmonary artery is already mentioned. It's a gold, still considered as a gold standard for comparison when you want to check the stroke volume and cardiac output. But because of its complications, time consuming, many of the issues, it's outdated. Coming to the VTA, American Society of Cardiotherapy, Sorry, American Society of Echocardiographic Guideline recommends using both transthoracic and transesophageal for assessing the stroke volume and cardiac output in determining response to the medical and surgical therapies. 
the concerns on circulatory shock and hemodynamic monitoring by the task force of european society of intensive care medicine also provides a similar recommendation you can use point of care echo either transthoracic or transesophageal to get a stroke volume and cardiac output value coming to the physics and principles so how we are going to apply when you going to you are going to uh, get the echo probe or you are going to see the left ventricular right prop right how we are going to apply what is the physics behind this and what is the principle behind this Uh, cardiac output you know that stroke volume multiplied by heart rate what is the stroke volume it's end diastolic volume minus end systolic volume so we are going to take the left ventricular outflow tract as a cylinder okay when the cylinder if the flow of you can you assume that the flow in the cylinder is constant then the flow is equal to cylinder area into flow velocity okay this principle can be used to estimate blood flow across the valves okay and the cylinder area the cylinder area is calculated by measuring the diameter of the valve and the velocity v is the flow velocity which is calculated by measuring with the help of doppler so i'm going to explain in detail regarding this coming to this image as everybody knows that the uh, first image i can point this image okay the first uh, left upper image it's basically if you see it's a left atrium left ventricle from the left ventricle there is a left ventricular outflow tract so exactly the aortic opening okay at the level of aortic opening when the valves are completely opened that area is called as the you that area is a cross sectional area what we want to use it so that you consider it as a cylinder so you if you take it as a cylinder as from the aorta opening okay the area can be calculated the cylinder area can be calculated by pi r square okay so so now our uh, main area is how will you tell that is a stroke volume okay the volume that is missing after the ventricle squeezes out what it will represent the stroke volume for example here during a heart beat the left ventricle is pumping an amount of blood this volume the volume of blood that is propelled by the left ventricle into the aorta that aorta is a cylinder like structure okay so vta treats aorta as a rigid cylinder which is not a perfect assumption but allows for a almost very near approximation of the volume that is moved from the ventricle into the aorta so during a heart rate how much amount of blood which is moved from the left ventricle into the aorta so that that will almost gives you stroke volume or you can remember it as vta measures how far blood travels during that time period that exactly that time period how much uh, like uh, how the how much uh, distance the blood travels okay so if you consider as a cylinder you see the right side uh, diagram if you consider as a cylinder okay that is the aorta so that area can be calculated by it's very simple formula pi r square or pi d by 2 whole ratio square coming to the how to so we got a cross section as i already mentioned left ventricular outflow tract velocity first you have to calculate the cross section we assume that the aorta as a cylinder and we found that cross sectional area is pi r square now we are going to see the velocity okay time so we are going to see the flow velocity how will you calculate the flow velocity with the help of an echo uh, cardiac probe there is a option called doppler okay it's called pulse wave doppler okay so what you have to do is you have to take a five chamber view okay in the right side diagram which is only one diagram you can see that the aorta valve is opening you keep the pulse wave doppler at the opening of the aorta and you press the pulse wave doppler you will get a waveform that waveform is recorded as a spectral curve you can see the down there is a down down shaped wave is there the area within the spectral curve is calculated automatically in the machine you have to just trace the area with that the area the machine itself will what is the area so once you get the cross sectional area and you got the uh, area within the spectral curve that is the velocity time interval you multiply it the cross sectional area into vta you will get your stroke volume so coming to the calculation how you are going to calculate so there are steps okay so we'll go each by step by step so that there will be more clarification how to calculate so i am going to do with the step 1 that is your basic need is you should get the parasternal long axis view and everybody knows you take the cardiac probe point the probe to the left, tip of the right shoulder okay and you will get an image the second image where you can see the left a left atrium is there which is opening into the left ventricle from that there is a left ventricular outflow tract above that there is a right ventricle between that there is an interventricular septum is very clearly it's there in the both image one is the pictorial representation other is the echo representation you can see properly 
the left atrium, the left ventricle, the left ventricle outflow tract into the aorta valve, and above is the right ventricle. So you should able you should be able to get the uh, parasitic long axis, which is very easy. You can keep at the third or fourth intercostal space, left sternal border, and make sure that the probe is pointed towards the tip of the right shoulder. Okay, so left uh, left third or uh, left sternal border, third or fourth intercostal space, probe towards the tip of the right shoulder, and you will get a view. Once you got the view. Your next step is so you can see the echo that properly the you can see that uh, one image where I'm uh, put the image where you can see the outflow tract. Okay. Now coming to step two, measure the LVOT diameter. So how are you going to measure the LVOT diameter? Coming to the left side diagram, pictorial representation. Very important thing is you should always measure the diameter when the valves are wide open. Okay. That is exactly at the mid systole level. So that is the best view of your aortic valve at the mid systole level where the valves are wide open. Very easy. You can even zoom out through the ultrasound machine to get a better view. How will you calculate the area? Very simple. You there is a measuring tool in every ultrasound machine. Measure it from the aortic annulus at the base of the leaflet. Very important. Another point is you should always measure at the aortic annulus at the base of the leaflet. Once you measure, it is always usually it is within two centimeter. Okay, typically this measurement is around two centimeter. If there are no other valvular problems, always it's usually less than two centimeter. So we got a uh, four chamber. We, we got a four chamber. Uh, sorry, we got a uh, parasitic long axis view. Next step is measure the elevated diameter. You can measure it by pressing the freeze button. Once you freeze, once you freeze the button, then next is. Uh, you can calculate the uh, uh, diameter by, by using a measuring tool. Coming to the step three, next is get the apical five chamber view. Again, this is very uh, very important. Every time we use to get an apical four chamber view, but apical five chamber is not that easy, but it is not that complicated. Also, only thing is you have to keep the probe exactly in the fourth fourth. Uh, ch uh, four chamber view and just tilt the probe little laterally and to the three o'clock position. Okay, so the probe point will be there. So the probe probe marker point you just tilt from the four chamber view, tilt little laterally and to the three o'clock position. You will get a five chamber view where you can see the image where the aortic valve is opening into the outflow tract. You can see it properly in the echo image what what i have put in the slide okay so once you go once you get the five chamber view next step is you once you get the five chamber view the next step is you place the pulse wave doppler gate at lvot okay so you can see the image where i have uh, where i have kept the the yellow marking is there there is two parallel lines that is called the pulse wave doppler gate so you keep that gate exactly at the opening of your aortic valve in the apical five chamber view. This is at the aorta annulus or base of the aortic valve leaflets. Okay. Once you kept there, then you press the pulse wave Doppler button again. Okay. So place the pulse wave Doppler gate at LVOT. Then trace the LVOT VT. Once your Doppler gate is in good position, activate your pulse wave Doppler. You just press it again. Then press the freeze button and the select the cardiac calculation package okay now below you will get a spectral curve with that you can calculate by tracing there is no option for tracing your measure you press the measure you just trace from the the line you, you just trace from the line uh, exactly for that spectral curve so the machine you just trace it the machine will give you the area under that spectral curve okay the LVOT VT will output as a distance in uh, centimeters and represents a distance that blood travels in one heartbeat. Okay, these are the steps. Again, step one, very easy. Coming to step one, get the parasitic long axis view. Step two, measure the LVOT diameter, very important, maximum wide open valves, freeze it, measure it. Step three, get the five chamber. First, you get the four chamber, then till to three o'clock position, little laterally, you will get the five chamber. Place the pulse wave Doppler. Place the pulse wave Doppler at the opening of the aortic valve leaflets. Next is press the pulse wave Doppler button again. You will get a wave tracing. Next, freeze it. Press the measure button. You trace that exactly the area under the line. That will give you, you, when you trace, the exactly the machine will calculate you the area. So this is a video which was done by our echo technician in OJSS hospital. 
so i have i have my own my own video by uh, i have done in my edit so this first you uh, observe this video so this is more accurate because they are more experienced person day to day life they are doing it multiple times so uh, i want to show that difference what, what like how i did and how the usually the cotechnician will do it okay so they are now right now they are calculating the lvot diameter they took a view okay they calculate the lvot diameter above you can see no need to uh, measure it and all above itself when you just trace it it will show your lvot diameter okay you can see properly the left ventricular outflow tract okay so yeah so now they again they want to check it again because the maximum the valves are open they they are check uh, make sure that the valves are maximum wide open and from that exactly at the annulus of the aortic valve they are going to measure the length usually it is less than 2 cm they are getting almost approximately of 2 cm okay once you get the uh, area sorry once you get the cross sectional area they are, they are going to keep the probe in the four chamber view first you see that they kept the first four chamber then they tilt and now you can see that exactly you can see the five chamber view okay so very very quickly within few seconds they uh, picked it up okay five chamber view and now they are going to place the pulse wave doppler at the opening of the aortic valve Okay, just wait for a few seconds. They are going to place the pulse wave Doppler. Yeah, they have placed the pulse wave Doppler. Okay, and they have seen the spectral curve. Okay, and they are going to trace the spectral curve next. Okay, just click the measure button. You can trace it exactly with the machine. And they are going to draw a line from the exactly the curve. That exactly the shape of the curve. They are going to draw the line. <coughs> So they are taking one. They are taking that one pulse, the one spectral curve, and they are measuring it. Okay, from the baseline, coming back and going back. Okay, yeah, they are properly tracing it. Once you trace in the right side of the screen of the echo machine, exactly LVOT VTA, it will show what is your area. Okay, very easy. No need to calculate nothing. Just trace it. It will show your LVOT VTA area. Clear. Okay, so this is an image. This is an uh, image where I did in my. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Okay, just one second. Yeah. Here. Okay, so this is uh, where I did in my uh, ER. Okay, we got a patient. Okay, and I took the pi chamber view. There is an option to uh, reduce the speed. So very slowly you can see it, how the valves open widely. So I reduced the speed. I took the four chamber view. I make I made it freeze. Then, then I reduced the speed. And now I'm calculating the distance very easy from the maximum wide opening of the your left ventricular outflow tract. Okay. So I'm just measuring it. Okay, so I, I got a almost a centimeter of 1.71. Okay, uh, sorry. Yeah. Next is how I'm gonna check the pulse uh, BTI. So I got a five chamber view. I kept the pulse wave Doppler at the opening of the aortic valve. Okay, exactly very close to the aortic valve opening LVOT, and I'm, I just kept the pulse wave Doppler where I got a wave tracing proper wave tracing is there. Okay. You freeze it. Okay, once you get a proper wave, you freeze it. And then you're going to measure it. So you press the measure button and you're going to trace it. Okay. Yeah. So coming to calculating the stroke volume and cardiac output, we got the LVOT area. Okay. In centimeter square. Then we got a VTI, okay. So stroke volume, LVOT area into VTI will get you the ML, that is a stroke volume, okay. Cardiac output, stroke volume into your heart rate, ML per minute. 
coming to application law of this vti this this so again our case scenario this can we give fluids in that uh, our patient if we give fluids how uh, like how the patient will tolerate that that amount of fluid okay so there are certain uh, entities where we have to know here first is trochoidal area constant vti changes the very important thing is the area of the cross sectional area you can take it as a constant okay the vti can change that is a very important thing you should remember here as the area of the lvot remains constant always vti is the most important factor influencing the change in trochoidal and thus can be used as a surrogate the normal lvot vti is 18 to 20 meter centimeter okay what is important is the large difference in calculating the stroke volume occurs with the just minimal difference in the measurement of lvot if the lvot diameter changes for example it is pi r square if it is 2 cm okay you calculate you get a value and if it is 2.2 you get a value that values are there is a large difference between the value so that is why what they are telling is you always make lvot the diameter of the cross sectional area make it as constant for example first time when you are going to do it for next calculation of the vti you use the same value no need to check it every time because once is maybe some inter observer or when you going to do next when the patient is having more heart rate or patient is having bradycardia it may change so when you get a exactly at what first time take it as a constant for multiple assessment you calculate the vti but you take the cross sectional area as a constant given that lvot diameter is essentially constant as the lvot cross sectional area there is no need to measure it repeatedly and this should be done on set the baseline and then the same lvot cross sectional area is used for serial estimation of your stroke volume and your cardiac output okay there are other formula also if you are not getting your left ventricular outflow rate diameter you can use this formula which is published in 1992 0.01 into body height centimeter plus 0.25 okay the stroke volume and cardiac output is the same across each valvular orifice in the absence of significant valvular regurgitation or intracardiac shunt very important when you are going to do make sure that the patient is not having any valvular regurgitation or any other uh, contraindications to do the vti what i am going to tell in my next slides coming slides okay if there are problems if for example if you are going to do the uh, aortic valve there is a valvular regurgitation or there are some uh, shunt uh, physiology is happening you can use even right ventricular outflow tract or mitral valve to calculate the vti more important than using isolated values of lvot vti yes here is a point where i am going to tell you what is the importance so for example our case scenario we are going to give a patient we we calculate the vti we got a value and we are going to give the patient a 250 ml of fluid and we want to check the vti again after giving the fluid maybe you take it as a time interval of a half an hour to one hour so you check the vti you given fluid 250 ml for half an hour and you want to always you want to recheck the vti then only you can tell that is the patient fluid is able to tolerate or is the patient is going into overload or not that is very important that is it is not an isolated value which is going to help in the volume status it is always parameters in that is you have to monitor frequently that is that change in cardiac function in response to treatment are more important than single static measurement this is very important then coming to how we can apply this vti in shock as you know that there are different types of shock hypovolemic shock cardiogenic shock distributive obstructive distributive your septic shock will comes under distributive shock so how are you going to use this vti in shock for example if you are going to in hypovolemic shock before giving fluids you can check the vti okay you check the vti and you found that it is in hypovolemic definitely it will be less than 80 okay and you give you do plr passive leg raise before giving fluids you can give a passive leg raise test and you see that there is an frequent there is more than 20% increase in your vti so initial vti for example patient came with acute ge no no comedy nothing just came acute ge we checked the vti it comes to 16 and you plr when you do a passive leg raise test you got that vti is increasing to 20 that means you can give fluids to the patient that patient is hypovolemic shock in hypovolemic shock not only vti make sure that you always check for your lv rv ivc so the vti is not the only one uh, uh, technique where we can give fluids no it's not the only single entity there are other things to consider along with it vti should be added okay so always check the lv rv and ivc in hypovolemic shock uh, look Look out the Doppler suggests some outflow obstruction, kissing, ileated, left ventricular, small chambers, any source source of volume loss. You have to look in hypovolemic shock. 
coming to cardiogenic shock again the vt will be less than 80 when you check first you give inotropic agents and you see how much if you do plr for a cardiogenic shock you are going to do a plr and you found that it is not increasing then you start inotropic agent and you see that if it is increasing the vt is increasing on the baseline more than 15% then okay this patient uh, indicates that you can't give fluids okay can be still be fluid responsive okay that is why you have to check the plr test if you do the plr still it is after plr also after plr it is increasing slightly then you can give a aliquot fluid of bolus distributive shock usually vt will be more than 22 because the usually the distributive shock mainly they are talking about septic shock which will be initial will be hyperdynamic lv where your vt will be more than 22 with low blood pressure okay so early early on hyperdynamic lv late on reduction fraction early the lv will be hyperdynamic later on in septic or any type of distributive shock the lv will be reduced with a low eti you should always look for the source of distributive shock from the lung or abdomen coming to obstructive shock always it will be less than 18 with rv failure or tamponade or tension pneumothorax so all rv failure is common in ards with mechanical ventilation and one more thing is all mcconnell sign is not pulmonary embolism okay the right ventricular free valve measurement to rule you always look for the right ventricular free valve measurement to look for tonic it is a tonic right ventricular problem or not ecg is very important lung ultrasound is very important to pick up the pneumothorax pericardial effusion with signs of chamber collapse also you have to check is there any what are the other types of obstruction is there or not okay now this is, is the very important slide where i'm going to tell you how we how we will tell this patient is fluid responsive or the patient can't give fluid or how the patient is going to have a fluid tolerance level or not okay very important you going to do a plr test if first you found that your vta is less than 18 you going to do a plr test passive regress and you found that the vta is increasing more than 15% that means you can give fluids if not can't give fluids that is called as fluid responsive contractile reserve first vta was less than 18 you do a plr test and it is not increasing you started inotropic agent the vta increases by 20% that means that contractile reserve that patient can't give fluids this patient need anotropic agents not the other way you can't you if it is not improving then you have make sure that you can give fluid and see the check response next is fluid tolerance is the patient is tolerating fluid or not very important always we'll assess the lungs look for the b lines in the lungs e bar e dash less than 14 the e bar e dash is basically called early mitral inflow velocity and mitral annular early diastolic velocity this is again a different entity it has its own techniques to calculate its e bar e dash indicates basically left ventricular filling pressure you know that there are some patients can come with ejection fraction normal but still, still the patient can be heart failure this called as mostly diastolic heart failure patients so in those patients if you see this e bar e it will be more than it will be elevated more than 40 so fluid tolerance means there are no b lines the e bar e is ratio is less than 14 and non pulsatile portobello as everybody knows that pulsatile portobello indicates the patient is having patient is in fluid overload status okay yes coming to rush vti yes in emergency department rapid ultrasound in shock and hypotension is called rush rapid ultrasound in shock and hypotension we use this rush protocol to look for what is the cause of what is the foci of shock or hypotension now recent updates they added vti along with the rush protocol so rush protocol as everybody knows we use every most of the ed physicians or ed people or ed uh, jrs will practice this rush protocol to uh, look for where is the source of uh, shock or hypotension in rush we use very easy you can remember as he uh, map h i m a p he is for heart in heart you this is this he map is under this rush protocol you can finish it by using a curvilinear probe so you just keep take the curvilinear probe in the heart is there a pericardial effusion is there a, how is the global ventricular function is any rv strain is there and what is your baseline lvot you can calculate coming to ivc is the ivc collapse or not i am morrison's pouch in the right upper quadrant okay you have to look for any pleural effusion or hemoperitoneum is there which is the source of uh, uh, volume loss coming to iota any aneurysm or dissection which is causing the shock coming to p is there a pneumothorax which is causing the obstructive shock so he map remember this 
with us all almost the karvini near probe we can keep keep the probe at heart go to the ivc go to the morrison's pouch go to the iota go to the pulmonary or the lung uh, uh, area where we look for pneumothorax okay once you get the shock again i mentioned in the last the below slide uh, with the vti the goal is to keep vti between 18 to 22 if it is hypolemic, the LVOT VT will be less than 18 cm and the, you give a fluid, the LVOT will increase by 15%. In a cardiogenic, LVOT will be less than 18. You give fluid challenge, if you give fluid challenge, LVOT can increase more than 15 or if the patient is contractual reserve, you give inotropes if it is more than 20%. Obstruction, LVOT less than 18. Again, you give fluid challenge if it is more than 15%, okay, you can give some fluids, but more than that, it does if it is not improving, that means you can't give fluids, you have to read the obstruction. Coming to distributives or septic, early the LVOT will be more than 22 late, it can be reduced. Again, the you see, give the fluid challenge, if it is increasing more than 15%, okay, fine. If it is not increasing, you start inotropes, if it is more increasing more than 20%, that means the patient requests inotropic support. Coming to pronouns and cons of the uh, velocity time interval, very easy, it's a bedside. Easily available, non-invasive, low cost, repeated assessment. This is very important. In emergency department, there's a very low application. Uh, I, I, I can conclude this. You can't much use for uh, as an ED. This is very important in ICU setting, in critical care setting, where you can frequently assess the patient. In ED also, it's possible, but usually we want to keep uh, the patients in shock long time in ED. So what is that? This is very even uh, more, um, I, I, I will say more very important in ICU settings where you can repeatedly assess the patient. Helping in sorting out confusion between should we give fluids or not. Interobservable variability can happen. One patient, uh, one, uh, one, one technician can do a VT and found that there is a value difference. So that also can occur. Lack of proper technique again very important. Coming to one more thing is there are this can be affected by certain LVOT abnormalities such as aortic regurgitation, HOCM, systemic anterior motion of the anterior metal leaflet or subaortic stenosis. Even in case of atrial fibrillation or any type of uh, such type of systoles, what will happen is there is different filling times result in beat to beat VTA variability. So what they are telling is one reference in 2021. What they're telling is you calculate five times a VTA and take an average of it. So they are also in atrial fibrillation also still you can use, but it can have a bit to bit VTA variability. Coming to feasibility of the VTA in point of accuracy settings, how feasible it is, okay? There is study carried out by Bergoson, evaluated echocardiography parameters versus the LV function in 50 patients in shock and mechanical ventilation. Almost 95% he was able to uh, get the proper view and the repeatability was high. Didn't at all uh, show an emergency physician can accurately measure the uh, stroke volume and cardiac output using transthoracic equity in the emergency department. In this study, they included 97 patients. They were able to obtain almost 78.4 patients. They were able to obtain the LVOT VTA. And more recently, McGraw at all showed a feasibility of 78.7% for the LVOT VTA. Coming to the recent updates, uh, this is uh, uh, done in an ultrasound channel. They took a five case scenarios, all different, all are post-op patients, okay, and they uh, simplified the algorithm. They added the left ventricular outflow tract, and they also added the uh, rush kind of a rush protocol in it, and they came to an algorithm. This is the algorithm. I'm not going to explain this algorithm in detail, but I will tell you, they took the VTS 16 to 20 normal, okay? Less than 16 is, you know that uh, uh, it is low VTA, more than 20. So they, uh, what we in uh, literature says is you take it as 18 22 but they took it as 16 to 20 okay two differences there and they uh, assessed in a certain uh, way uh, if it is 16 then they check the pericardial function they check the rv function they check the lv function then they came to cardiac terminoid or if it is rv function is there is it obstructive shock then if the lv function is embedded is it cardiogenic shock or if there is if the patient is fluid responsive even as uh, it is hypolemic shock or not or if the LVOT is more than 20 it can be distributive shock or not okay so they made an algorithm okay uh, that's it so they included the velocity time interval plus kind of a rush protocol okay uh, they take the they took the cutoff as 16 to 20. so coming to the another study 2020 ultrasound journal uh, what is the rational way for using velocity uh, for calculating the stroke volume and cardiac output? And this study found that it is simple, feasible, and reproductive measurement, the VTI, 
and it can serially track the uh, stockoem and cardiac output thus they are high value in hemodynamic monitoring especially in critically ill patients in a point of care settings in addition it is also able to predict the outcome of the selected patients okay coming to uh, another study which was done in heart failure patients okay almost they took 100 heart failure patients cardiovascular ultrasound journal they, they calculated they follow up the patients for a 12 month follow up period okay and they found that extremely low lvot vt strongly predicts adverse outcomes they calculate the uh, uh, event of the heart failure patients they followed up the heart failure patients and they predict the adverse outcomes and identify who may benefit from most from the advanced heart failure therapies okay with the lvot measurement another uh, in neonates they found that uh, i already mentioned you have to keep the pulse wave doppler exactly at the atrial valve opening okay this study found that it's in pediatrics what they found that 2023 european journal of pediatrics they found that different location of your left ventricular outflow tract when you are keeping the pulse wave doppler at different location of your aortic valve the values may change okay so that's why this study found that so so when i after looking to this study then i searched the articles and found that there is it's a very uh, simple technique we can follow you uh, make sure that the aortic valve you you you, you assume a midline in the mid, you assume a uh, like a line in the aortic valve midline okay you keep your pulse wave doppler try to keep at exactly at the midline or within 20 degrees okay or, or less than 20 degrees to that midline so that is a technique you can use to avoid uh, error okay so this is the one study uh, i found that different values are getting so i went and checked the other different studies and i concluded i i and i found that this is the best way to assess either you keep in the exactly at the mid line of the opening of the aortic valve or 20 degrees within that mid line to keep the pulse wave doppler line coming to in aortic regurgitation they have done a vti to compare the degrees of the aortic regurgitation and they have found that it is inversely proportional if it is more the severity is less okay so vti of ours inversely associated with aortic uh, regurgitation severity regardless even it is regardless of the left ventricular diameter volume heart rate diastolic blood pressure or ejection fraction so this could be used as a uh, in future it can be used as to marker the assessment of ar severity okay so coming to the take home points always uh, here what i want to tell you is we always found, uh, we always find a difficulty in getting a five chamber view so on you uh, uh, when you are getting a four chamber view uh, tilted to the three o'clock position little laterally always try to get a five chamber view then use vti especially to measure not for the just for that uh, uh, the static measurement i am telling what i am telling is you measure it then you give the uh, treatment modality and you see the change okay and you see the change how the patient is improving that is very important and make your skills sharp and precise by practice which is very important you know that even ultrasound even uh, multiple like daily 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 you use it use it use it it will be more friendly and more user friendly coming to references uh, these are my references okay uh, then this is a flash card where uh, everybody can uh, keep it in your phone and or uh, phone you can save it it's a flash card i will send it in the group you can just save the flash card whenever you have a doubt how to calculate just open this flash card just follow the steps calculate lvot vti and use it thank you hello 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 sir hello sir hello hello uh, hello sir hello uh, hello am i am i audible sir yeah yeah you know okay 
so any doubts i'm i'm going to check the any doubts regarding velocity time interval i think sir it's a mute sir uh, just I think host has muted the yes. Hello. Yes, sir. Yeah, yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, host unmuted me. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, I, uh, well presented, uh, Rubin. I think Dr. Guru Prasad is here. Guru ah, Prasad, sir. please go ahead, sir. Shravya, you have to unmute. Am I unmuted? Yes, 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 sir, yes. yes sir. Uh, hi, Ruben. Hi, sir. How are you, sir? Uh, fine, fine. Wonderful presentation. Thank you, sir. Yeah. yeah. Uh, um, uh, if you can un unshare your screen. Ah, sir. Uh, I have got just few comments to make about uh, um, uh, the VTI exactly how how you should expect a vti trace okay? yes sir yes sir and how and how uh, you have to get that uh, diameter there are some hmm. modifications small modifications that's all can i add to it yes sir sure sir definitely okay have you unshared your screen uh wait, hold on sir yeah it's still your screen only yeah, yeah. stop sir. okay yeah, I, am I allowed to share the, my screen? Yes, sir. Okay, I'll try to share. Yeah, okay, okay. Okay, uh, see, uh, uh, can all of you hear me? Yes, yes sir. Yes. Yeah, so this is what uh, Ruben told. So you take a plaque view, isn't it? Yes, sir. Plaques view, then uh, you freeze it. Yes, sir. Okay, uh, you freeze, freeze it. Freeze it while maximum. Uh, maximum of your valve opening yeah exactly 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 so uh what we have to ideally do when we do a echocardiography is we have to have an ecg leads connected to the uh, yes. uh machine Basic, so you know at mid 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 ha, at, exactly mid system so that will uh, negate the intra observer uh, this one okay for some the uh, valve may just disappear off and you think that it has opened fully. Okay, why they say uh, it should be in mid system because the valve will be fully open and the, that is the time uh, the LVOT is the widest. Yes. Okay, sir. now uh, uh, Ruben rightly pointed out that uh, the formula what we, we use is for volume is pi r square h. So pi yes, r square sir. is uh, the area and h is the height and the height is calculated, uh, height is equal to volume. Okay. So actually the velocity is converted to volume by that equation. Yes, sir. So uh, that height gets converted to velocity. Okay. And that is a, uh, then the formula gets converted to volume. Here, uh, what ideally you have to do is once you freeze and take the maximum, uh, once you freeze the image, okay, there is an option of zoom. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. So yes, when you zoom, see, this is the full view. Uh, yes, what sir. you are seeing, you can see my, uh, this one, uh, uh, cursor. Yes. yes okay, sir. this yes. is a full view. So once we get this, we have to zoom only this part. Okay. Yes, and sir. that is the yes. time when you get this view. Uh -huh. Yes. So what yes. happens is uh, the um, error in calculation comes down because what uh, the, you have to calculate the diameter and make it mm. half. Yeah. Okay, because the area, the formula for yes, area sir. is pi r square. So, 
if uh, there is even 0.1 or 0.2 uh, millimeter difference in your calculation will change the it gets uh, the high, it gets doubled almost yes sir because you are squaring it so one thing what you have to do is you have to zoom that part huh. then take the uh, ma maximum diameter just below the aortic annulus yes sir okay yes. hope uh, everybody is clear about this yes, okay sir. so this is about the measurement so next coming to uh yeah next coming to the uh trace vti trace vti trace so uh, what is an ideal lvot vti trace mm. okay mm. so uh, whenever you take an ideal vti trace the envelope should be hyperechoic yes. this is called as the yes. envelope okay and the center part should be Hypo uh, hypoechoic huh. So that, that because here, see, there are two types of Doppler. One is a continuous wave Doppler. Another is a uh, pulse wave Doppler. So here we are using this pulse wave Doppler. Okay. Yes. So here what happens is this is called as a, this uh, equal to sign. Uh, that is a sample volume. Mm. Uh, whereas if you are putting a continuous wave Doppler, the velocity is taken all along the line. But mm. in a pulse wave Doppler, it is only this sample at this sample. So see yes. how it is kept there. So that sample ka uh, velocity will come. So that trace will be like this. A hypoechoic uh, border and a hypoechoic uh, center. Okay. Yes, so that is one. The next thing is, can you see this line? Yes, sir. That yeah, is... Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. That is the aortic click. Yeah. So an ideal, an ideal LVOT trace should have that aortic click. 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 Ah, see, like in, this. For uh, that, we have to... Exactly. See, now, if you take this uh, uh, image, no, sir. okay, uh, if you take this image, you don't see the clicks here anywhere. Ah, yes. Yeah, okay, but in this image, uh, very nicely, you can see the click. You can see this, na? Yes, sir. I'll just show. Okay, this is the yeah. IoT click. So an ideal trace should be one, the envelope should be hyperechoic, the uh, inner part should be hyperechoic and it should always be followed by an aortic click. Yes. Okay. So yes. that is an ideal VTI tracing. Yes. So this is what I wanted to convey. I think hope people are, uh, uh, because uh, unless uh, we calculate on this uh, 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 an ideal trace, our yeah, calculation sir. of first the stroke volume, everything will go uh, way higher. Yeah, change. It will okay. change. Correct, 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 correct. Uh, I am uh, done, Raghu. This is what I wanted to convey. I'll unshare. Again, sir, is mute. Raghu, you are muted. Yeah, uh, Naganan sir. I think Naganan sir is chairing this session. Naganan sir. Yeah, yeah. yeah Naganan. You are not seen and not heard also. I have been uh, muted. Yeah, you can, uh, video also you can switch on. My Chennai partner, Naganan. Yeah, Rubin, uh, really well presented, actually. Uh, you know, yeah, uh, ETF, uh, well, first, my suggestion is whenever you put such topics, no, many yes, people sir. don't know what is VTI itself. Yes, sir. You have yes, to sir. mention at least echocardiography. <laughs> okay, sir. Okay, sir. Uh, correct. Otherwise, people will not come for the class. If you sure, like sir. getting something else, it is VTI means something else. <laughs> I okay. requested Dr. Naganan to put like that topic name. So okay. I think many people would have been attended this. They think something else topic is going on because many they, people are they, not they, aware. They would have thought Ruben is talking on an engineering topic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, and at the emergency itself, people are doing uh, calculating VTI and all. It is really wonderful actually. Uh, yes. Even many people, critical care people, still are learning these things and all. Uh, very good uh, presentation. Uh, and uh, also you have uh, a few more things like uh, you know not only that. Fluid overload the now. Protocols. Most important now, recent thing is you know, pulsatile uh, portal vein. Yes, sir. Pulsatile portal, portal vein. Vexus, 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 vexus. Pulsatile means it is a more of fluid, is more. We are doing fluids. 
uh, now also we can see hepatic vein uh, 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 femoral vein and renal vein also good actually the chart was very good when we can give fluid responsive fluid tolerance the difference is the fluid responsive and fluid tolerance and also velocity tolerance means uh, yes. contractility tolerance yeah. that, so that is also very good actually okay. uh, very interesting i really enjoyed the topics Rangan, Nagan, sir and keshamurthy sir anything to say we are also started practicing after rubin presented it to us <laughs> <laughs> I updated the software in our uh, information. I think uh, we will. I think it needs a lot of uh, learning curve, especially the five chamber view. Yes, and uh, I think we daily have to do with all because the patients. Because after that... uh, after I uh, after I read this topic, sir, I tried because usually we won't get a five chamber view in our uh, point of care echo cardiac screening. We'll go for a um, uh, short axis view, long axis view, fourth chamber view, and uh, subcostal view. We will finish our screening echo, but. After doing this, I am now for every patient, I am trying to get a five chamber view and just uh, calculate the VDA. Even if you are not able to calculate the area also, you can approximately put a two, you can get a VDA and you can see the change in the, uh, when you're going to give a treatment modality, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, point taken well from Guru, sir, also. Because yes. the reproducibility is always a question to us. Whenever yes, I change the minor changes, what we find, where we have to put the exact measure, especially in the uh, when monitoring the uh, length of the LV protein, that was yes. causing us the problem. I yes. think the zooming it and put it at the exact annular base was uh, really makes and that LV protein measurement makes a lot of difference. I feel the point millimeter <coughs> change will change almost the VTA. It will change the VTA and, uh, and diagnosis of what type of shock also. I think. Yes. And, uh, and for and for all the students who were here. When uh, Ruben spoke about uh, uh, passive leg raising, okay, passive leg raising with VTI. So how you do is uh, same like how you do the other uh, methods with the intraarterial line. Here, what you do again, you make the patient uh, slanted in forty-five degrees. Okay, then uh, as Ruben told, the uh, diameter will be the same whether the patient is uh, supine or uh, uh, not in 45 degrees okay you take that and keep it separate okay next is uh, make the patient uh, 45 degrees uh, head up then uh, do the vti yes okay once you do that then you make the patient flat with the legs raised wait for about 30 to 45 seconds then you do a repeat uh, vti at the same place yes Ah, that is a proper VTI uh, variation, LVO2 VTI variation. That if it is more than 15%, then the patient is fluid responsive. responsive. So this is how you do the passive log grossing for a LVO2 VTI. Okay. Any, any more questions sir, from the audience? You are muted again. Tamma is angry with the uh, Ravna sir, I think. Huh. Uh, there is one question is there in the chat box. Yes, sir. Uh, sir. What is the position of the patient and, ba and back crest should be made supine? And uh, what, sir, what measurement of VTA? Nothing, sir. It, it, it's it, because once you are going to check the VTA uh, uh, like, uh, frequently, so what was the first position we checked? You, we will try to follow the same position when you are going to assess the repeater, like multi second time or third time. And I think uh, if, uh, every time we gonna uh, if you're gonna we are gonna start some anotropes also we'll wait for one hour to see the VT response. So same way that hourly we can see the VT and uh, and we can chart it how much it is improving or not or is it decreasing trend or the patient is uh, uh, ideally not improving with anotropes or patient may require some uh, aliquot bolus or not. So that position initial position usually usual what we'll follow is uh, 45 degrees patient will be. In a 45 degree, if there is no contraindication, head and 45 degrees elevation uh, from the like trunk 45 degrees elevation, you can do a normal echo screening. We can do from <laughs> with that same thing, uh, same position. You can frequently assess it. If there, if the patient is lying completely supine, no problem. In the same way only, we can assess it. The only thing is when you're going to do the uh, this one passive leg raise test, then as Guru sir mentioned, it should be 45 degrees when you're going to check the passive leg raise test. If there is no contraindication. So, Sundaram, I think Sundaram has asked that question. See, passive leg raise 
the technique of passive leg raise remains the same whether you are using it for pulse pressure variation or um, stroke volume variation whatever is you, what whatever you want to see there what you are doing is uh, in all those methods you have got an arterial line and you see the change in the pulse pressure isn't it or yes. the stroke volume here uh, instead of using the um, arterial line you are using the lvo to vti yes. the other uh, other um, uh, procedure is the same of the plr it remains the same 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 here only the method of calculation of stroke volume differs that's all hope sundaram okay. is clear yeah he is understood thank you okay. ideally one more question is there sir ideally how much fluid uh, do we give for a fluid challenge it's it's actually uh, uh, <coughs> subjective because uh, usually what i prefer is we will give 150 ml to 200 no, ml i i will tell this i will answer for this question fluid challenge is, is nothing but giving a smaller amount of fluid in a very short duration example you can give in 5 ml in 10 minutes 1000 ml in 15 20 minutes and see the response see the response of heart rate see the response of bp see the patient is uh, comfortable or not okay fluid challenge that is what fluid challenge actually started but the problem fluid challenge is the fluid patient is fluid responsive well and good he can take yeah. fluid If the patient is not fluid responsive, and this find it or thought it itself can become, you know, overload. Uh, fluid overload and go for pulmonary edema. Then only we start seeing CVP, pulmonary atrial occlusion pressure. Now we know that static pressure is not helpful. We are going for dynamic measurements. In that, in, we are seeing this pulse pressure variation and uh, uh, passive leg raising test with the LVOT and uh, uh, fluid uh, uh, fluid challenge. This is the best way we can manage. Uh, uh you know uh, uh, and another one is uh, passive leg raising even uh, we can just uh, raise the legs it is a you know auto fluid challenge means we can uh, uh, remove the central fluids immediately when the patient uh, legs is lying uh, came will come when well, i don't so that also can be done if you don't want to give fluids and see so fluid challenge means it is a it is not exact is volume you can give 500 ml in 10 minutes or 1000 ml in 15 20 minutes give faster fluids small amounts fast fluids okay good uh, uh rubin thank you so if you uh, come you know if you uh, learn more and more and start presenting like this you know where we are uh, standing and we can improve ourselves as yes. group of us every day is a learning day it yes. doesn't you one day you will not get five chamber review next tomorrow you will get it next get day it. you will not get this sir was telling you no know, that iot click next day we will get it every uh -huh. day is a learning day we have to learn every day and uh, yes. you improve it nothing it never stops yes okay. yeah yeah learning is every day last two days was a heavy learning for me i had been for a te <laughs> workshop to mumbai uh. <laughs> thank you sir thank you rubin yeah. thank you guru sir thank you rubin yeah, yeah. yeah. looking yes, at rubin thank you rubin thank you looking at rubin and nagananda for me atls comes in my mind